And you want to do you want to share your slides, Rick? Sure. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining Monty Hart again. Um, good afternoon for those of you who are in Europe. Um, we have a really exciting session today because I think we talking about one of the most topical areas in Tavi, uh, which is really what happens when these valves degenerate and how are we going to treat them. And there's no one better to talk to us about this other than Uri Landis, who's really, I think, you know, he started early on an amazing registry that many of us participated in. And from that registry, has really been able to come up with a lot of interesting data that is helping to guide our decision making. So we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us here at Monty Hart. It's always a pleasure to have you know friends and colleagues with, that we can learn from. So thank you. Okay. Good morning, Azim. Thank you so much for for inviting me to give to give this uh, talk and give me this opportunity. Um, I, I just want to start by saying that when I sat down to prepare today's talk, I realized that the name I chose for the lecture is. It's a bit too presumptuous, uh, so I, I may be apologizing because it appeared quite appealing at the time before I started walking on the, on the slide and obviously realizing that I don't know the implications with so many independent variables. But nevertheless, I will try to cover as much as I can from feasibility to what we or what I know today. Um, so, so let's start. Okay, obviously, Tavi volume already exceeded that of surgical AVR in practically all Western countries. So you can see from these very old data that in Germany, this is ancient history. And this process was obviously supported by multiple randomized trials in high, intermediate, and then low surgical risk patients. So for two or three years now, many Tavi procedures are carried in younger and lower risk patients than ever. Undoubtedly, these trends have major implications on patients' life expectancy after TAVI, and undoubtedly that these trends are expected to continue. And these trends are also reflected in, in real life, but also in the guidelines, where two years ago, there was a shift of TAVI being an option in patients at 65 years of age. And as a result, it is anticipated that many of, these, of our patients will outlive the transcatheter valve probably similar to what we see today with uh, patients that outlive those surgical tissue valves. Yet robust data on long-term durability of transcatheter valves are still missing, which in conjugation with the wide application of TAVI in, in younger patients creates some concern. So this is a CT scan of a degenerated panus rich THV. So treatment options for failed THV include surgical TAVI expand, or transcatheter implantation of second TNG. And the heart team decision between these two therapies should be tailored on the basis of the underlying mechanism of THV dysfunction, the aortic root anatomy, as well as the patient's clinical condition and procedural slash surgical risk. So we initiated the Redo TAVI registry in 2019. This slide is not completely updated. We currently have 45 centers uh, included. And this is the first report from the registry showing this procedure to be relatively safe and effective in patients deemed suitable. Well, Reditavi is not yet common. And it is also important to highlight that THV dysfunction can happen due to device failure, like structural valve degeneration or valve thrombosis, endocarditis, or any combination of this, but also uh, secondary to uh, suboptimal TAV implantation, right? Malpositioning with suboptimal sealing or uh, sizing errors, etc. These are procedural failure in blue. And these are two completely different situations. So terminology, I think, is extremely important. I think all these patients should be regarded as TAV in TAV patients but only TAV in TAV that is done as, as a separate repeated procedure should be regarded as redo TAVI. I want to show one slide uh, about this subgroup of patients, of bailout patients, even though this is not the topic of our talk today. Uh, so here we did a one to four propensity matching between 213 urgent double valve TAVI, 
right, bailout valve and valve against 852 single valve savvy patients, asking what are the risk factors to require an urgent device implantation, tav in tav, how often does it happen and what uh, does it cause? And we can see that supplementary valve was implanted mainly due to uh, residual aortic regurgitation after primary valve malposition, either too high or too low. At higher risk were patients with a bicuspid valve, uh, a significant AI, alternative access TAVI, and also early generation uh, THVs and self-expendable THVs. Uh, compared with standard single valve TAVI, double valve TAVI was associated with high burden of complications and mortality at 30 days, but not at one year. And the good news is that I didn't show this here in the slide, but the incidence is decreasing. So five to 10 years ago, urgent tav and tav implantation was much more common than it is today. But let's go back to the redo TAVI subgroup and start with a quick descriptive summary. So mean patient age was 79 years, STS risk of 7%, and the median TAVI to redo TAVI time was five years. Most patients presented with advanced symptoms and the mechanism of valve failure was diverse, about a third in each uh, category of stenosis, insufficiency, or combination of the two. Uh, for time's sake, I will just skip this slide showing the type of valve used. So using the VAG2 criteria, we found that device success was achieved in 85%. Okay. Uh, most failures were due to high residual gradient or insufficiency those were observed in 12% and in 8% of the cases, respectively. At 30 days, there was one case of disabling stroke, one case only of coronary obstruction, we will talk about it later, and no cases of annular rupture or conversion to surgery. Implanting a new permanent pacemaker was necessary in 11%, and there was no correlation between the pacemaker rate and the THV type. Well, naturally, Ridutavi was associated with significant symptomatic improvement and with significant increase in aortic valve area and decreased pressure gradients. Uh, when evaluated according to the valve failure mechanism, the residual gradient was five millimeter mercury higher in patients with baseline pure aortic stenosis compared to those with baseline mixed or pure AI. The difference in gradient was also noted according to the baseline valve size. We used a 23 millimeters as cutoff. So this is more or less what we know from valve in valve in surgical tissue valve, but maybe, maybe less, uh, less pronounced. So no patient was lost to follow up and survival rate was 98% at 30 days and 88% at one year. So pretty good. Uh, definitely better than urgent bailout tav in tav which we saw. As seen on the right, mortality rate was similar between patients with different valve failure mechanism and in patients with small versus large valve size. So let's, let's summarize this. So we, we see that mortality at one year is pretty much comparable with other valve in valve registries as, as the Vivid, the Partner2 and the TVT. Yet residual gradients are generally lower than what we see after valve in valve in surgical valve. High residual gradients were observed in 12% of the cases, which is about half of the incidents reported after TAVI in surgical valve. And I think probably the larger internal diameter and greater expandability of THVs account for this advantage. Uh, some factors that are associated with residual high gradients is the same as in surgical valve, but the magnitude of effect was absolutely uh, smaller and none had a negative effect of, on survival. And also when we looked in propensity score matched cohorts of TAVINTA versus TAVIN surgical valve patients, TAVINTA was associated with similar safety and mortality, yet higher procedural success, mostly due to better hemodynamics. So, the main technical issues with TAVI repeatability are three, right? Interaction with the coronaries, residual hemodynamics, and thrombosis slash durability. 
So let's spend the rest of our time talking about this. So thrombosis and durability, we have almost zero data. We can maybe extrapolate from the TVT and from the redo type registry that it is okay up until two years later than that, we don't know. Now, depending on your first valve type choice, you may end up with either one of these four combinations, okay, we see on the picture. And we know that the unique configuration of balloon expendable versus self-expanding THVs potentially result in different tavin tav interactions, performance, and also safety that should inform device selection for redo TAVI and perhaps also for the initial TAVI in patients in whom redo TAVI planning should be advocated. So we did this analysis trying to assess the outcomes of redo TAVI according to these valve types with the primary outcome being VAX redefined device success, procedural safety and mortality at 30 days. One analysis was done according to the initial valve type and a second analysis according to the second subsequent valve type. Now, these data are soon to be published, so I cannot show everything, but just generally speaking, a cohort of almost 600 consecutive TAVIN TAV implantation, 250 patients were excluded as the TAVIN TAV was done in an urgent fashion. 312 patients were analyzed using propensity weighting. Although uh, we did exclude more patients, as this figure illustrates the distribution of time between the first and second TAVI procedures, you can notice that a relatively large proportion had their TAVI TAV done already within a year of their first TAVI. And as the indication for redo TAVI in many of these early presenters is probably suboptimal valve implantations rather than temporal valve deterioration, uh, these 90 patients were excluded from the analysis. So very shortly, these are the baseline characteristics of the adjusted cohorts, which were well balanced with similar age, similar proportion of comorbidities between the cohorts. Also similar were the baseline aortic valve mean gradient, the valve area, and the mode of valve failure. Okay, this is very important for comparative reasons, obviously. In addition, we made sure that the complementary valve type and label size were similar, the redo TAVI procedural year, and the time elapsing between the first and second TAVI procedures with a median of five years in each of these four cohorts. So I will not say the numbers, but generally saying that the rate of device success was similar according to the veil fail valve type, but higher if a self-expanding THV was used during the redo TAVI. Redo TAVI safety remains similar regardless of the utilized TAV type, and the rates of all other VAC redefined endpoints were low and comparable, no difference in vascular complications, bleeding, pacemaker, and etc. So the type of failed valve did not significantly change the residual mean gradient after redo TAVI, but the type of utilized TAV did make a difference. And if we look at the subgroup analysis comparing the four different Tavin Tav combinations, the residual mean gradient was 15 millimeter mercury after B Tav in beta, balloon expendable in balloon expendable, and also after B Tav in S Tav in self expanding. And it was around 10 millimeter mercury after both S Tav in S Tav and after S Tav in beta. So, in conclusion, we can quickly summarize that the type of initial valve did not affect redo Tavi outcomes. The type of subsequent valve did not affect procedural safety or mortality, yet using a self-expanding THV was associated with higher device success. But there is a big but uh, to our analysis, right? It is observational, there is a risk for unmeasured bias, and the number of cases and follow-up are limited. And I think most importantly, this population consists of highly selected patients who survived to the second procedure and were deemed anatomically suitable for redo TAVI. So we do not know how many were denied if, uh, due to anatomical concerns. We also don't know how many were uh, died before redo TAVI could be attempted. And I want us to talk to focus on those anatomical concerns that may exclude patients from redo TAVI. Um, 
hoping to illustrate that although the first valve did not affect the outcome of patients deemed suitable, it has dramatic impact on suitability for reductavi. So the group for Copenhagen have evaluated the interaction of these combinations with the coronaries. The coronary arteries originated below the top of the nerve skirt in 90% of coval first cases, compared with two thirds of sapient first cases, okay? And impossible coronary access was observed in a quarter of coval first cases and in only 10% of sapient first cases. So in this regard, it seems simpler maybe to start with a ballooned expendable valve to help maintain better repeatability in terms of coronary access maintenance. Now, when planning reductavi, it is important to consider the geometry of the failing THV, which vary also in terms of shape and dimension of the metallic stent frame, as well as the position of the leaflets within the frame. The THVs with short stand frame are the sapien family or my valve or lotus are intra-annular valves, while THVs with tall stand frame can be either superannular like the volute or the accurate or intra-annular, portico or navito, etc. And finally, some self-expandable valves have enclosed frame with cells, a volute or portico, while others have an open frame like the accurate, which only have stabilization arches. And the shape and stent type of the failing THV, also nitinol versus cobalt chromium, is also important and can determine the diameter of the covered tube formed during reductavi. So for example, an hourglass shape of the volute, right? Um, is smaller than the nominal size of the valve, right? 34 millimeter volute has a 24 millimeter waist. And this waist may be pushed outwards uh, towards the coronaries during reductavi, particularly if a relatively large balloon expendable THV is used, sized to the patient native annulus or to the failing THV inflow diameter. In contrast, the sapien or lotus have more rigid and cylindrical frames, which are less likely to expand significantly outwards during reductavi. And this is regardless of the type of second THV implanted. However, if the first uh, valve is underexpanded and anatomically of the native annulus is per permissive, I mean, dimension wise and calcification wise, Overexpansion of the index THV can be attempted before implanting a second valve uh, in order to optimize hemodynamics. So we're talking about the nail skirt a lot, but what is the nail skirt exactly? So following TAVI in TAVI, the leaflets of the failed THV will be pushed aside and upwards to form a sort of a conduit, right? A covered stent. Now, as leaflets position may diverse across different THV designs, tall frame devices with super annular leaflets will inherently produce longer slash higher nail skirts. The leaflets of the sapien we know extend to the top of the stent frame, thus the nail skirt height is essentially the same as the height of the frame. In contrast, the leaflets of the volute, for example, extend approximately two thirds the way up to the stent frame. So the nail skirt height also varies uh, according to this and also according to the THV size. I mean, a 20 millimeter versus 29 millimeter sapien or 23 millimeter versus 34 millimeter evolute and et cetera. And you can appreciate from this figure that the nail skirt induced by evolute is almost twice higher compared to the, to the one induced by the sapien, uh, 16 versus 26 millimeters. Now we know that recently, especially with self-expanding THVs, but this is true for both stent platforms, there is a trend to try and implant devices as high as possible, looking to mitigate the risk for conduction abnormalities and pacemaker implantation, especially in low risk individuals, younger patients. However, that may not be ideal for all patients. 
So keeping the nurse skirt in mind, if we do read of TAVI for the patient on the left, where the index THV is positioned very high, this would lead to sinus sequestration, right? Whereas if we position the first THV lower as seen on the right, then that risk should be lower. And at the end of the day, we probably don't want to systematically implant low, nor do we want to systematically implant too high, but rather to evaluate and look for the optimal implantation plan that is individualized and can keep the device above the membrane of septum, yet not jeopardizing the coronaries or the STJ above. And this depends on individual patient anatomy, index THV measures, and future THV planning all integrated together. The next important concept is leaflet overhang. So let's say that we already have a patient with a tall frame THV and superannular leaflets, which are marked in red here. So in case the distance to the coronaries appears to be an issue, we may still have the option to implant a short THV relatively low, thereby to push aside only the lower part of the leaflets, avoid pushing the leaflet tips towards those impending coronary ostia. So leaving some degree of leaflets overhang may allow us to reduce the nurse cut height, diminish the risk for coronary obstruction and also augment future coronary access. Now, Ran Kornowski sent me this, uh, I think beautiful case that demonstrates how can we actually use this. So this is a post-TAVI patient that presented a few years after TAVI with severe intravalvular aortic insufficiency, no AS whatsoever. And you can see how the coronary ostia in the city originate very close to the failed evolute frame and right at the level of the evolute leaflets. With the VTC being extremely short, Valsalva sinuses are totally effaced practically, right? So this appears to be a tav in tav no-go no -go case. Yet, by implanting uh, the Sapien 3 very low, as seen here, uh, just below the origin of the evolute leaflets actually, 100% leaflets overhang, Look at this beautiful result. No AI, no gradient, no high risk surgery with THV extraction and, and patent coronaries. And of course, this is impractical in stenotic THVs. We might consider a balloon valvuloplasty prior to Tavinta, but it could be more problematic. The impact of leaflets overhang may relate not only to how much overhang is being left, but also to other features. If only the base of the leaflets got degenerative while the tips were spared and kept thin and flexible, then leaflets overhang could be well tolerated as we've seen in the, in the prior case. Uh, if however, the tips of the leaflets are also calcified, stenotic, thick and rigid, leaflets overhang may be less well tolerated. And this clearly is an area where further research is needed I mean, will balloon predilatation help or be mandatory or will pre-procedural city be able to guide us in this regard? Very stimulating questions to ask. Um, now, axial, axial valve alignment, right? Necessary to prevent the multiple layers implanted to become impossible to cross. Not only commissural alignment to aid leaflets modification procedures, and also easier future coronary artery cannulation, but also on the right, you can see stencil alignment, which is important. Patient-specific commissural alignment can be reliably performed in most patients using the coronary cast overlap fluoroscopic view. It's not only commissural alignment because you know some patients have coronary ostia eccentricity, so it's more important to, to put the coronaries in the middle of the leaflets. And probably all next generation THV are uh, to incorporate some feature that will enable to achieve this more easily. Commercial alignment of the second THV is also important to maintain coronary access, especially when the second THV has a tall stent frame and superannular leaflets. Uh, in the meantime, uh, obviously development of specialized guiding catheters with dedicated curves or steerability 
uh, will, will be useful. And now currently we know that many operators just downsize their guiding catheters for coronary cannulation in those post uh, TAVI patients or use uh, non-selective wiring, micro catheters, and et cetera. So I thought uh, we should end up with, with a case uh, to clarify the last issue or that is problematic. So this is a 71 year old male with severe peripheral artery disease that had his first TAVI done in 2012. In 2017, five years later, he presented with decompensated heart failure and was found to have elevated gradient across his TAVI valve with a CT scan that showed degenerated, thickened, and calcified leaflets with panus on the ventricular size. Uh, and redo TAVI uh, was carried out using Sapien 3, again, avoiding high risk uh, surgery. Not sure why these videos uh, delay so much. And then in 2019, only two years later, he again presented with elevated aortic valve gradient. And by the way, also had his uh, coronary originate just at the THV outlet of his second year, uh, two year old uh, Sapien 3. Well, this time he finally went for surgery and actually had a, a good recovery, uh, had his tav in tav removed. Uh, with my last follow-up was six months ago and it was okay um, and not completely updated. And this example is just in order to demonstrate that Redutavi durability is also a key issue that we need to investigate before we can say that Redutavi is useful tool available for the overall uh, AS or overall TAVI population. Now, for this case, I'm not completely overwhelmed about the short two-year uh, period, the specific patient experience, since if we look carefully on the post redo TAVI floor imaging, we can see that the sapien is severely underexpanded with this clear waste I marked in, in small green dots. Uh, I think a smaller yet more optimally expanded THV would probably be a better strategy. And I think it, it nicely demonstrates we still have a lot to learn about durability in general about sizing, about malexpansion with pinwheeling and et cetera. And, and we are currently trying also to learn what is the optimal depth of TAV in TAV implantation. Obviously this is very hard given the variety in anatomy and variety in THV configurations and failure mechanism. But nevertheless, we have seen interesting discoveries using a fit plot and spline smoothing plot of implantation depth versus one year mortality. The general idea is to use a spin method to detect the inflection points of the implantation depth just by visual examination of the inflection points. Uh, it's roughly around minus two and plus six millimeters, which are also the 25th and 75th percentile of uh, implantation depth we see in the, in the registry. So we still have a lot of work on this. But it could be very useful if we can come up with some guidance to how to implant these devices in the best way we can. And I just thought I might as well finish by looking through my uh, pink lenses. I hope I was able to demonstrate some of the uh, considerations great, for having for having What, sorry? No, it's great. I mean, I, uh, um, I, li I like the video you ended with too. Uh, <laughs> Uri, thank you so much. I mean, I like, you know, this is such an important topic, and I, again, congratulate you for really pioneering the research in this field. Uh, there's so much we still have to learn about, you know, how we treat these valves when they fail, but I'm glad that we're talking about it openly and we're starting to figure it out because it's going to become um, always a more common problem that we see. So... I don't want to talk a lot. We do these sessions for the fellows. Uh, so I'm going, to have, I'm going to hand it over. We have fellows and both uh, local and international who are part of our team. And so I'm going to hand it over to them to answer questions. And I'll just help move it along based on who I see on my screen. So uh, Augustine, um, you want to go first? Yes, with pleasure. Thank you, Adim. Thank you, uh, Professor Landers, for this uh, amazing talk. Uh, 
I was wondering because we, we saw recently the publication from the John Webb team regarding uh, late post dilation. Um, what uh, is your uh, thought about this and how do you use this uh, uh, publication in your daily basis uh, or practice, um, your algorithm to decide about what to do? Uh, okay, nice question. Thanks. Um, question. Well, it's hard to say how do I do this in my everyday practice because I don't see that much patient yet uh, with coming with the TAVI failure. Um, I think balloon, late balloon post dilatation is basically practicable in balloon expandable valves when the frame is more um, rigid and can react to the balloon and stay, stay there. Um, uh, right now, we are collecting data on the on residual parvalvular leakage after TAVI. Uh, these patients can be treated either by balloon post dilatation, if the if the sapian or the, or the balloon expandable valve was under expanded uh, for the first time, uh, or by you know uh, PV leak closure uh, or TAVI in TAV. These are the three strategies. Um, it's hard for me, it's, it's so individualized. Uh, you have to take into consideration whether it is a, a protruding calcification, then it might be not safe to postulate aggressively uh, the device. And um, if it's uh, already extended you know, uh, very well, then you got nothing much to do with balloon. Uh, I think the, the John and, and his team published uh, 11 cases in that series of aortic valve uh, post dilatation with balloons. So it's very hard to say, yeah, but it, it's, good, it's, it's a good tool, tool to have. Yeah, I think it's an interesting concept because, you know, we often have this discussion when we see patients like one or two years out and their gradients are a little bit up or there's PVL, you know, is it safe to post dilate the valve? Can you damage the leaflets? Uh, so even though it's a small number of patients, I think it's reassuring that this is a technique you can try at least uh, to see if you can get a better outcome before considering valve and Tavi and Tavi, right? Um, great question. Um, Pierre Pasquale? Yep, Dr. Landis, thank you so much for the talk. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, my question is kind of provocative, I guess. Um, uh, we're talking about redo TAVI and eventually TAVI, TAVI, TAVI. Um, do you see in the future, like for example, by 2030 or so, um, when a patient like in his early 50s presents to you, uh, I guess today, most of the people at least would eventually at least at first consider mechanical ABR and then eventually go from there. Um, do you think eventually we can aim to a bioprosthetic uh, pathway kind of place. Uh, so considering, of course, coronary heights and you know annular size and all of that, uh, do you think in appropriate selected patients, uh, it would eventually become possible to offer you know, uh, either a TAVI in TAVI in sever or a TAVI in surgical uh, and then repeated TAVI? So do you think a bioprosthetic uh, uh, valve pathway would eventually be possible uh, in this kind of very young patients that do not want to undergo mechanical and anticoagulation? Well, I think, I think, I think the, the, the answer will come from the industry and uh, with other solutions. If, if I really want to, if, 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 I'm, if I'm serious here. So I think the industry is working very hard on, you know, durable synthetic tissue valve that will eventually uh, somebody will come up with it sooner, probably than later. Um, I don't. I don't believe that the babushka technique, like valve in valve in valve, is is good for anybody. Mm -hmm. um, I think a second hit, like valve in valve, is is okay. But you see, in, in in surgical valve, a quarter of the patients end up with high residual gradient after valve in valve. So, um, so I think the 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 answer for for younger patients will be either having a mechanical valve with no need for anticoagulation. This is one, one side of the, the solution or transcatheter valve that will be very durable. 
All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this whole sort of matryoshka Russian doll concept of putting one inside the other without being able to remove the leaflets is is just not a concept that's going to going to work long term. Um, Sebastian, thank you for joining us. Sure. Um, thanks, Azim, and thanks, uh, Uri. Um, I never, never had the chance to congratulate you in, in person. We all you to this registry. It's really a great, uh, great effort and great uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, lifetime of aortic stenosis is a very um, hot topic. That's uh, in always every conference. There's a session about it. Um, so you showed us that uh, the median uh, time to um, tap and tap uh, is about five years in this registry. Were you able to, um, you know, extrapolate, or maybe what's your what's your idea on this? Um, which patients are really, you know, prone to early valve degeneration? Um, um, with regard to, you know, referring them for uh, for tavery or to, um, you know, redo surgery. Sorry, uh, I didn't hear you very well, but I think I think I heard most of it. Sorry. If if I'm not answering everything, just uh, ask me again later. So. Um, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg because the patient that in the registry were had their TAVI done five, seven, eight years ago when we didn't do low risk patients, we didn't do relatively young patients. So the, the competing risk for mortality is extremely high. And we just see very rare cases with a combination with good survival and probably some risk factors for early degeneration. I don't think this represents the true durability uh, of these tissue valves. We, we can see that the eight years durability of the, of the self-expanding valve is very good. We, we see this in the Notion trial. Uh, we know also that the balloon expandable valve durability is very good. We, we, we know that from the intermediate risk patient of the, of the Sapien uh, studies. So, I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, we, we actually, I really want to try and look for risk factors for early degeneration. degeneration. Uh, it's very challenging because then I have to collect uh, a lot of cases for, for the control group. Um, but this is a, <laughs> another, another future project, probably. I mean, in the, while I know it's not scientific because you don't have a control group, has anything like struck, struck your eye about you know, the patients you're seeing? I mean, for example, are you seeing more under expansion with balloon expandable valves or a high incidence of chronic kidney disease or end stage renal disease? Anything that, that's- Absolutely that's, not, absolutely common? zero. No. I don't have all the data I need mm -hmm. for, for really look for factors, but no, a kidney disease is not a risk factors uh, from our data. Mm -hmm. um, so no. <laughs> okay. Before I go to Nikos, there's a there's a couple of questions from Mohammed on the chat, and I think they really interesting, and I wanted to address them. So, Mohammed says, you know, we don't really have AI yet or virtual Tavi and Tavi prediction models yet, uh, where we can do it with software. So, currently, when you see a young patient with a long life expectancy. How do you decide that he'll be a good candidate for Tavi and Tavi in the future? I mean, do you look at, do you have any rules? Do you look at coronary height, sinus of El Salva, STJ? What do you do in your practice, Uri? So I think, I think first of all, the CT scan is, is key. And if the CT shows that, the, and most of the patients, it does show it, that it, it, it is okay. The, the, most patients will, be able to go tab in tab, I think. Uh, I, 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 I saw you know, one of the slides show the, the Copenhagen group study showing the CT scan after redo TAVI. So there was a problem with not a few cases, but most patients had permissive anatomies. Um, I think patient wish is very important. So if today, uh, a 70 year old patient or 68 year old patient I just had really wants to avoid surgery. And I obviously discuss it with the surgeons as well. 
but I don't think it's a mistake uh, in relatively younger patient that can go uh, through both procedures if, if the anatomy is, is, is big enough uh, to do either of the two. Okay, great. Um, Nikos? Yeah, thank you so much for your uh, talk and uh, for this very important study. Um, uh, one question I have is, and I know it's, it's really tough to answer it uh, from a registry, but I think it's kind of important to uh, see how we lifetime manage this patient. If you had to make a prediction, um, how many of those patients you think uh, would be suitable in the future, given all these structural limitations to get a, a TAV in TAV? Do you think we're going to be in the range of like 15% or we're going to be in the range of like 80%? Because I think that is going to change uh, our, our lifetime management. Maybe have a surgeon take this valve out and then go for a tablet for the next valve. Um, and, and then also the other question I had is, uh, given that the coronary access seems to be an issue, uh, what are, do you have any data on like uh, leaflet modification with Basilica on those on those valves in your registry? Uh, I don't have this data. I don't have this data. But I think some procedures in our structural uh, world. Um, are, I, I don't know, I, I, you know, some centers do uh, basilica or leaflet modification procedures in like uh, more than 10% of the valve in valve cases and they do fine. They have really good results while other do zero and al also don't have that much complications. Now, I don't want to underestimate the problem. There is obviously, there is a problem, but, um, but I think, but I think for me, it's very interesting because when I talk with, with interventionalists, just personal talks, some say they are very, they, are done, they haven't seen a patient that they excluded from Ridutavi due to coronary arteries issues. Well, this may be, maybe, it, it may be not true because we don't see that much patients, but what I'm actually doing right now is pros prospectively collecting cases that not only were treated with Ridutavi, but trying to collect all the patients that presented with Tavi failure that, was, that were either treated with Ridutavi or with Tav uh, extraction with surgery or with medical treatment. Uh, really interested to, to look at the proportion of medically treated patients because this is very important. Great. Uh, Samina? Thank you very much for the great talk. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is about the risk of stroke in this procedure valve in valve and is uh, using cerebral protection devices a routine and must uh, in these patients. And the second question is the antiplatelet regimen. Is it, do you use any, any different protocol for these patients? Good questions from the fellows over here. They got you on yeah. the spot yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, we we don't we in our center there is uh, some um, financial difficulties to use uh, cerebral protection devices, so we don't use them that often. Although we should probably use it a bit more. Um, I think I, I I don't know if there is any difference between valve in valve in transcatheter versus surgical tissue valves. Uh, I think it's more related to the, to the amount of calcification, the, the age of the valve, how many years have passed. Um, and regarding the, the anticoagulant regimen, I wouldn't use anticoagulation at this point for, for aortic valve in valve as a routine. Um, mitral valve in valve is may, maybe different. Um, I, I don't. I don't know the answer. Personally, I do not prescribe uh, anticoagulant medications after valve in valve. Yeah, there's. I just think there's not a lot of data, so it's difficult. It's kind of very yeah. individualized practice right now. Yeah. yeah. Andrea. Hi. Thank you for this great talk. I just wanted to ask you this. Uh, already, Sebastian and Nikos just this, did that, but everyone is speaking about lifetime management. So I wanted to ask you, which is your strategy for a 70-year-old patient with an anatomy suitable for a 26-millimeter valve? Uh, which first valve would you choose and the second one, if needed? Um, so actually, my boss decides. 
<laughs> so it's very easy to say. I just do what I um, um, well, I think, I think I, I, I think there is some advantage uh, starting with a balloon expandable device uh, and leaving enough room for a self-expanding device later on. You know that uh, very recently, uh, Michael Rirdon presented uh, data showing a very good durability of self-expandable devices compared to, to surgical valves. So it's very hard to argue against putting a self-expanding device. Um, personally, I my feeling that, that there is something uh, that is more right to start with the balloon expandable device. This is uh, zero data based on, on, on nothing except for my uh, perception. Yeah. I agree. I think that's certainly what we've been doing too. Manaf, did you have a question? I think Manaf may be rounding. Um, so there's another question from Mohammed, which I also think is very on the chat, which is really re relevant. Uri. Um, you know, there's been some data from the explant registry uh, where they've gone to explant uh, Tava valves. And I have to admit, the data doesn't look great. Uh, I mean, quite high mortality rates at 30 days in one year. Um, and it kind of makes us look bad in the, in the structural world that, you know, um, that if our valves fail and they have to have surgery, that surgery is not great. Uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts about explantation. And then um, we'll answer Mohammed's uh, second question is about whether there's any difference between removing a sapien versus an evolute. Okay, thanks. Um, so I think from what I hear is that um, the, the two main problems with Tavi explant is that lack, lack of experience of the operators because it's still rare. So the few operators who does it more often are getting better. Um, and the second probably biggest issue is that the patient selection, right? Then those patients who were referred for TAVI because they were not suitable for, for surgery to begin with, now come up a few years later for a surgery, which is more longer and more complicated. So, um, you know, not, not few patients had their uh, valfara due to uh, endocarditis and, and other reasons that are not uh, inherited to the valve. So it's very hard to say. I, I sure hope that in the near future, uh, surgeons will get better at it and patients will be uh, at lower risk. Yeah, absolutely. And then as far as, re as removing them surgically, I think everybody agrees it's harder to remove a tall valve than a short valve, mm. uh, particularly the, the self-expanding valves, tall expand self-expanding valves, because they can become endothelialized with time. And I've seen some of these videos and you know you have to have a good surgeon who can actually go down and scrape between the valve and the aorta and detach the valve from the aorta or else you can really uh, you end up having to re replace the whole root or ascending aorta if you're not careful mm. whereas in Edwards you just go down you grab it you squash and you and you rip it out kind of thing uh, mm. it's a lot more <laughs> uh, aggressive uh, but easier to get to mm -hmm. okay yeah Uri, that was a great talk and it was a great discussion. Thank you for staying on for all the questions from the fellows who I'm, like I said, I'm always impressed uh, about the questions they ask because they really uh, understand the topic and they were really very relevant. So thank you for answering all of them and thank you for joining us at Monty Hart. We really oh, appreciate it. I'll thank see you, you next week.